नमस्कार एंड वेलकम टू दिस एक्साइटिंग एपिसोड ऑफ सथोलॉजी डिबंकिंग मिथोलॉजी सत मींस ट्रुथ लोगोस मींस स्टडी ऑफ साइंस और सथोलॉजी मींस साइंस ऑफ ट्रुथ और स्टडी ऑफ ट्रुथ अपोजिट ऑफ दैट इज मिथोलॉजी व्हिच मींस साइंस ऑफ फेक लाइ इमेजिनेशन स्टडी ऑफ फेक लाइ इमेजिनेशन मिथ इज अ संस्कृत वर्ड फ्रॉम व्हिच मेनी संस्कृत धातु फ्रॉम व्हिच मेनी वर्ड्स कम लाइक मिथ्या मिथ्याचार मिथ्या अहंकार मेनी अदर वर्ड्स आर देयर which denotes so mythology actually means somebody is trying to tell you that your history is not real your culture is not real and generally all the western universities classified all the ancient history as mythology so mythology has become a synonym for a history of whose basis is not known and that's we debunk regularly question the western academics regularly question the entire world who calls ramayan mahabharat as mythology because we have proved it i have written nine books and we have conclusively proved it that how mythology so ramayan mahabharat are historical facts and most of the occurrences happened the many of the stories over there come from different puran which sometimes markande rishi is speaking bolas is speaking asita devala is speaking dhamma rishi is speaking to yudhishthir but yudhishthir is real so So, without delay, I have a very, very special guest. This is the second show. He's joining us from Canada, Doctor Raja Ram Mohan Roy. Thank you so much, Aditji. It's a Welcome. pleasure to be here again. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the show. So, my before we start off the presentation, like uh, one question I have: You are going through the truckers' protest, and what is the dharmic view of all these protests, according to you? Just your personal view. uh i have not uh, looked into like uh, what is going on i mean i have not gone out much i mean you know because of the covid uh, all i go out for is uh, like for groceries and uh, luckily i mean we have not been affected so far i mean of course there is inflation so you can see the prices have gone up quite a bit and uh, but uh, I, i i mean it seems there from what i read there seems to be a lot of support for them so they must be doing something right i guess So they are they are scaring the American truckers now. American truckers are getting inspired from them. This is the first time in the history that the Canadian protests have inspired American protests. I, according in my life, I can say so always it has been the other way around. The, the Canadians were were influenced by the American actions, right, including BLM. Yes, yes. I mean, the, Canada is very close to USA, but uh, the, the, it's a uh, quite different culturally. I think. it's more towards the socialist uh, than the uh, us capitalism and both have their own advantages yes and disadvantages both have you know both are anything extreme is a disadvantage becomes a disadvantage you know so other yes. ramoji you can share your presentation and for the viewers we know we'll do the second part and uh, of of this presentation you did last time sheet anchors and uh, and also you know the sheet anchor may be a new term for many people but uh, it is a reference point to be just be precise it is a reference point which you can gauge and most of the presentations are there so that you can be inspired to go deep into your own research so don't blame the informer <laughs> just that's what i say all always so thank you so much you can start presentation then we can continue our discussion after this rajaram bhai excellent uh, thank you arith ji and uh, good morning uh, to all the viewers so this is the second part uh, of, uh, of my talk on the uh, indian history how it was constructed and uh, what could be possibly wrong with it so i go uh, i'll first give a summary of what uh, we discussed in the first part and so basically if you go to the ancient indian history it uh, has been constructed by going backward and forward from the two sheet anchors of indian history and these uh, sheet anchors they synchronize indian history with greek history and the first sheet anchor is the identification of sandrocotus of greek accounts with chandragupta maurya so basically you have got uh, the mention of sandrocotus in the greek accounts and uh, sir william jones in 1793 he identified the sandrocotus with chandragupta maurya and we have got a second uh, sheet anchor 
uh, which is uh, the identification of Devanam Priya Priyadarshi of major rock edicts with Ashok Morris. And this was proposed by James Prince in 1838. And the basis uh, for that identification is this 13th rock edict of Devanam Priya Priyadarshi. So basically the first seat anchor has been uh, contested that there is another person that could be Sandrokotas, uh, namely the Changgupta one of Gupta, Imperial Gupta dynasty. But there is the second one and this 13th rock edict on which then most of the ancient Indian history is uh, resting. So basically, even if you have uh, alternative for first seat anchor, the historians will tell you that there is the second one and which has uh, nobody has given any satisfactory explanation for this one. And this is the one in which you can see that there are five different Greek kings have been mentioned. So obviously, uh, those uh, five Greek kings need, need to be identified. They have been identified uh, by the historians and uh, they have fixed it around, let's say, 260 BC when Ashok Morj uh, got these major edicts written. So basically, then this uh, uh, shows you how the history has been constructed. We have the first seat anchor, which is Alexander meets Sandro about 326 BCE. We have got Devanam Priya Piyadarshi, identified as Ashok Morj. He mentions five Greek kings, which have been identified around 258 BCE. Then we go backward and backward to know the date of the Nandas, of Lord Mahavir, Lord Buddha, Buddha. And then you go forward, and then you get the dates for the Sung dynasty, the Kanu dynasty, then Andhra dynasty, and so on. So suppose uh, these uh, seat anchors are wrong. And if they are wrong, then there will be consequences. So basically, if uh, we have Chandragupta I, uh, who was really the Sandro Cortas and uh, contemporary of Alexander and Seleucus, then what is uh, going to happen? Uh, so we know that they are separated by about 650 years. Uh, that's the time between Changgupta Mods and Changgupta I. So if Changgupta I has been shifted by 650 years forward, uh, then of course there will be consequences for that. And uh, here I saw just uh, uh, how this could have happened. So basically, if uh, we have a shift like that, then you will see that possibly Lord Mahavir and Lord Buddha were 600, 700 years before the time that we have given them now, which is the 6th century uh, BC. So they could be in the, let's say, 12th century BC. And then everyone else uh, from that time has been shifted forward. And uh, then you will have uh, some of these people become contemporary of people who were not their contemporary. So basically what will happen is that if, I mean, the historical uh, time period is finite. So we are looking at, let's say, a few thousand years backwards. So if you take people and you move them forward, then you are going to create a kind of a vacuum in the history. Like you'll have people who were there and they have been moved forward. So there's nobody there kind of. So you'll have an uninhabited time period. And uh, so what will happen uh, is that uh, you will have a gap uh, in our history. And if you uh, look into our history, you see that we have a big gap, let's say, from the end of the Indus Valley civilization uh, to the time of Buddha, which has been fixed into uh, 6th century BC. So basically what happens is that uh, uh, our history actually begins in the 6th century BC uh, with the Buddha and uh, the kings who were his contemporaries. So basically before the 6th century, you don't really have uh, any fixed dates for uh, any historical person. You just have a kind of a general history in which uh, you have got Aryan invasion and then you have got uh, uh, different time periods. But, but it's a qualitative description only. You don't have any person fixed with uh, any dates if you go back. And But what will uh, then also happen is that we are going to move people forward, uh, let's say, uh, some people by 6th century, but other people will be moved by different time periods because there are different types of evidence which need to be fit in. So, but you are going to bring people uh, 
uh, where there are already other people. And so you'll have a, like a congested time period. Because obviously, because we cannot keep uh, continuing uh, shift everything because uh, somewhere it has to be fixed and uh, then we know the history. We cannot be six centuries ahead of ourselves. So somewhere things need to be fixed. So basically what will happen is the whole order, whole sequence of things uh, will get messed up. And uh, you will see that uh, happens in the sixth century. Uh, and you have got four mighty empires of the Imperial Guptas, of Olikars, of Mokris, and later Guptas. And they are vying for the same space in time. So, no, so we know that uh, the Olikars uh, came towards the end of the Imperial Guptas. And we also know that the Mokris and the later Guptas, uh, they were contemporaries. But there is no evidence that the first two, the Imperial Guptas and Olikars, were the contemporaries of Mokris and the later Guptas. And uh, so here, uh, I give, uh, give you an example. Uh, this is a quotation uh, from the book uh, uh, by uh, Sri Goyal, uh, Harsiladit. And uh, in this, it says, it, the book is in Hindi, so I've translated it. So it says that it should be remembered that the time of both Isan Varma and Jivit Gupta one falls between 520 to 540 AD. But this is exactly the time of the Malva uh, Olikar Emperor Yasodharma whose known date is 532 AD. And we'll, uh, at, uh, at a later uh, uh, point, uh, go into the details of the whether this time is right or not. And uh, then he has been given the credit for winning the region from Himalayas in north to, to Brahmaputra River to the east. So clearly, he would have won Bengal also. Now, it is clear that Jivit Gupta won Isan Varma and Yasodharma they all claim to have won Himalayan region and Bengal between 520 to 540 AD. So within a 20-year period, all uh, these people are claiming uh, sovereignty, uh, claim to have won this place. But the empires do not uh, go in and out uh, so fast. Now, the other uh, co consequences. So basically, you can see that uh, we have got uh, uh, people there, uh, the claims there that do not seem to be uh, justified. Some, and, uh, but they will be justified if they were in different time periods. So what will happen is that if, you, if people have been shifted, then it will create uh, different kinds of problems. And one of the glaring one uh, is the one of Nagarjun and Nalanda University. So basically what uh, will happen from this is you are going to push some people forward and some people have not been pushed forward. So the one that has come before is going to come after. Uh, into our history. And so let's see about the Nagarjun. So about him, uh, it is uh, well understood that he was his time was around, let's say, uh, 150 CE. And here uh, I give you a quote, uh, say that Nagarjun was born in a Brahmin family, and then he mid first to early second century CE, and then he converted. Uh, he was uh, sent to Nalanda University to study. So he was a student there. And uh, but also later, he also became the chancellor of Nalanda University. So first he was a student, then he became a professor, and then he became the chancellor of this university. And here we have another quote. It says, historical studies indicate that the University of Nalanda was established during the reign of Gupta Emperor Kumar Gupta. Both Wen Sang and Pragya Varman cite him as the founder. So basically, we have this Nalanda University, uh, the evidence that this university was uh, established was founded by Kumar Gupta one of the Imperial Gupta dynasty. And uh, here I uh, give you uh, another quote uh, that tells you that it was indeed established by uh, Kumar Gupta one because uh, here uh, we have uh, uh, from Wensang after the Nirvana of Buddha, an old king of this country called Sakradit from a principle of loving obedience of Buddha built this convent. So we are being we are being told that uh, the, this Nalanda University was built by Sakraditya. And you know that uh, Sakra is uh, uh, synonym for Indra and uh, Kumar Gupta one, his name was Mahendra Ditya, So he's also uh, known as Sakraditya. And then it continues uh, that the afterwards, the king seeing some priests who came from the country of China to receive his religious offerings was filled with gladness. And then it gives you more uh, people who followed after him. And uh, the final one is uh, really telling. The priests dwelling here as a, are as a body naturally dignified and gave so that 
during the 700 years since the foundation of the establishment, there has been no single case of guilty rebellion against the rules. So he's telling you, the Huen Sang, that it has been 700 years since the founding of the Nalanda University. But here is the problem. And the problem is that Kumar Gupta one Mahindra Aditya, uh, his time period we now have uh, as 415 to 455 CE. So how did Nagarjuna study and teach at this world-renowned Nalanda University in second century CE? Because university was founded three centuries later by Kumar Gupta one. Now, the, if you go uh, into the details, then historians will tell you there were some preliminary structures where there are uh, some, and uh, Kumar Gupta will just enhance it, but there's no proof of it. I mean, the proof says that he established it. And further, what we know that Wen Sang, I mean, he's just spelling is written differently than uh, some, it's also written at this X U A N Zhang. So, uh, just because of the Chinese characters, how to transliterate them. Uh, in Roman. So he says that he came in 7th century CE, but the Kumar Gupta one ruled only uh, according to the currently established history in 5th century CE. So it was only like two centuries between Kumar Gupta one and Wen Sang. But Wen Sang is telling you that it had been 700 years. But if you take 700 years, then here uh, you have proof that he, uh, that these imperial Gupta emperors like Kumar Gupta one their time period was like second century uh, BCE because uh, when Sang Mali came to India in like 630 CE. Now, if you, uh, to give you another example, uh, let's say about Hal Satwahan and Vikmaditya. So now we know that the King uh, Hal Satwahan, uh, he uh, wrote uh, Gatha Satsati and in 5.64, he talks about uh, the generosity of uh, Emperor Vikramaditya. But uh, the Vikramaditya uh, has been placed uh, in, uh, has been identified with uh, Changuptu Vikramaditya, and his time is 376 to 415 CE, according to the currently established history. So basically, what uh, you have uh, is uh, in the first century uh, CE itself. Uh, we have Satwahan talking about Vikramaditya, but Vikramaditya happened only uh, like what, uh, many centuries later, two, three centuries later uh, in 376 to 415 CE. So how could he know about him if uh, uh, Vikramaditya took place, uh, his reign was in fourth century? Uh, Hal Satwahan could not be talking about him. So that tells you that the Vikramaditya was uh, uh, before him. And we know that uh, we uh, have According to our traditions, Vikramaditya was in 57 BCE. And uh, in one of the later talks, I will talk about uh, this historical Vikramaditya. Now, we uh, have a th I'm giving you a third example, and that is of uh, Siladitya and Bapparawal. Now, we have got numerous uh, Rajput genealogies in which the Bapparawal and the city of Rawalpindi is named after this uh, great uh, uh, King Bapparawal. Uh, who protected India from invaders. Uh, in fact, he chased them much further, uh, far, far away uh, from the boundaries of in India. And he uh, was separated from his ancestor Siladitya by eight generations. So this will make him roughly about 200 years after Siladitya. And here uh, I give you a quotation for that. And this is by uh, Todd. Uh, he was a remarkable uh, person, a British person, but uh, very uh, sympathetic to Indians. And he has written three volumes uh, of uh, what he received. He was, uh, he talked to Rajputs a lot and uh, those uh, bards of Rajputs, the Chronicles, and uh, uh, he wrote down uh, the history according to uh, what he has been told by the Rajputs. And here he tells you that uh, we have, uh, he talks about the Siladitya and there is a, a story about him that uh, he had a seven headed horse, which was called Saptaswa. And as long as he had them, nobody could uh, uh, defeat him. Uh, but then a wicked minister uh, did some uh, conspiracy and uh, then the prince could not uh, ride the Saptas, so he did not come and then he lost. So that is uh, the time uh, when the Wallabi was sacked. So he was the emperor of Wallabi. 
and uh, after he was sacked then uh, his wife was pregnant uh, she gave birth to a son and uh, then you have said that uh, we know very little concerning these early princes but that they dwelt in this mountainous region for eight generations and uh, after if you continue reading and then you see uh, that uh, within its impervious recesses rose the three peaked mountain at whose base was the town of nagendra the abode of brahmans uh, so these people protected him uh, who performed the rites of the great god in this retreat past the early years of bappa wandering uh, through these alpine valleys amidst the groves of bal and shrines of the brazen ka so he, so you see that uh, we have according to our traditions that bappa uh, rawal uh, was a descendant of siladitya and was separated by uh, eight generations but if you uh, read the history books uh, you'll see that the bappa rawal according to the history books he uh, was born in 713 ce and died in 753 ce now the siladit itself uh, the last one uh, because this was sacked so he was the last one uh, siladit 7 and uh, we have a copper plate inscription of him alina copper plate and in which the year is given as 447 and uh, the modern historians they count it from the vallabhi era so they put him in 766 ce so we have a situation in which uh, the ancestor has been placed after uh, his uh, descendant Uh, who should be about 200 years but we can fix that and uh, i'll have uh, i will talk about that uh, in another part uh, later in the series so really uh, how are the things that are inconvenient uh, being managed uh, by the historians so what happens if if the history is wrong you will have a lot of uh, these kind of uh, in uh, convenient uh, facts evidences and uh, what the historians are kind of fixed they, they cannot change what is uh, uh, the, their chronological framework because uh, we have uh, no alternative uh, for this uh, identification of devan ampri priyadarshi with ashok mod so every piece of evidence uh, then whatever is inconvenient uh, they have to be somehow forcefully fit into the accepted chronology or if you cannot fit it then they have they will be declared as forgery so let's see how how is it possible i mean you can think that we we have a constructed a history and how is it possible uh, for it to be different because you'll see that uh, there's nothing that has been uh, in our history that has been dated scientifically or if there is any evidence that can be let's say uh, dated or whether that can be precise but you get the kings uh, telling you uh, that the numbers like uh, reign of their king in so many years or so but the historians have uh, got this flexibility of choosing when to start those uh, dynasties those kings those numbers so the zero point of uh, these uh, numbers that they come to uh, that have been given that's the evidence they can be interpreted in in a way that will fit into the chronology that has been developed so you know that uh, we have been taught that kanishk one uh, he started uh, his uh, his dynasty started in let's say uh, seven, he was in 78 ce but he was a kusan and uh, our records show that uh, it was the the 78 ce is the beginning of sakera so it was a sak king that had been defeated but they say though we called uh, any outsider sakera so they have got all these kind of uh, explanations but uh, the recent research by uh, mr professor harry pot and he says uh, he has found uh, that uh, the kusan era started 149 years after the sakara so he could not have been that sakara what we have been taught so kanish could not be there in 78 ce and uh, so basically this, that uh, kusan era starts in 227 ce but even that is very problematic uh, for the historians uh, because they have got uh, imperial guptas uh, right after uh, that so they have to uh, kind of fudge uh, this evidence and we will talk about that also later and so what happens is that we will also have evidence and uh, then uh, those evidence can be twisted and this uh, evidence is for imperial gupta dynasty itself and for this dynasty we have alberuni saying exactly this so as regards the gupta kal people say that the guptas were wicked powerful people and that when they ceased to exist this data was used as the epoch of an era so basically what uh, we are doing right now is we are starting the era uh, from that point but the alberuni says they had ended the guptas had ended and then when the era started 
and you can see that here on the is a again a major piece of evidence for reconstruction of indian history it is the samudra gupta pillar and uh, under that uh, pillar if uh, you go there and see it you will see uh, this uh, notice uh, that was prepared by james fleet and in which uh, you will see that it was next made use of by samudra gupta about the second century so see that he is putting the se se samudra gupta in second century but of course uh, uh, we now the history that we read uh, that places him like a uh, couple of centuries later and that's because at that time bernard fleet was taking alberuni's uh, what alberuni has written uh, as true and so he was trying to put it to the guptas before that time of 319 ce so what happens is that uh, there will be a lot of evidence that uh, will not fit at all and uh, they uh, then those evidences will be termed as forgery so we have got uh, an example here uh, and a, a paper by mr kamal p malla and we says mandev samvat an investigation into historical fraud so he just uh, makes this uh, claims that this whole thing uh, whole uh, mandev samvat uh, is a fraud and this is the uh, reference for that so what happens is that uh, the title of the paper is the symptomatic of the attitude that modern historians have towards our ancient records so the objective is not to understand what they mean but to declare as forgery whatever does not suit the accepted chronology and uh, here is uh, uh, the paper itself i have uh, just uh, some uh, screenshots this tells you the mandev sampat somewhat investigation into historical fraud and uh, this is uh, the reference and see what it says the above, above text has been transcribed translated and interpreted differently by different nepali and foreign historians of nepal uh, yet the fact remains that not a single of the figures for the six epoch eras mentioned in the sumati tantra yudhishthir 2000 nand 800 changupta 132 sudrak 247 sak 498 and mandev 304 matches with the known historical facts so just because it does not match uh, it considered a fraud but this one uh, it's a remarkable piece of evidence and this you can use uh, to fix uh the history the correct chronology but not only that this is the only piece of evidence from which we can use to identify who was the king sudra a very a very important piece of information and similarly we have got uh, another uh, i'm giving you an example of another one which has been uh, declared as uh, forgery and uh, these are the three different plates so these are the inscriptions on these plates and they were called bagumbra ilau and umeta plates by wheeler in a paper written in 1888 ce and this is the reference for that paper so basically these are the three plates and now these talk about the gurjar kings and they are again as i told you the historians have this flexibility of choosing uh, the zero point of uh, uh, these eras and in uh, in this case they have chosen kalchuri uh, chedi era uh, and even that start in 248 ce but the fu funny thing is there are lots of inscription that have been uh, like uh, you uh, used uh, it is said that the kalturi chede era is used in those inscriptions but they don't match even in those era and they have to uh, fudge it they sometimes say one year earlier one year later like that and uh, so here is uh, the screenshot from that paper you see that uh, this paper uh, is the gurjar inscriptions uh, by buller and uh, was written in 1888 and here you see you see that he says that the dr bandarkar assumed that the princes uh, of uh, i which will be that uh, ilau plates uh, were the same persons and then says but as the date of ilau was clearly the year 417 of the sakera so there is no doubt about that that it was in a sakera but it has been uh, interpreted as kalchuri chedi era and uh, similarly here you will see that uh, uh, its date again talking about the grant full moon day of vaisakh sak sambat 400 and then what what happens it does not fit and then we have got uh, dr bhagwan lal indra ji who was uh, working uh, with these uh, colonial era scholars uh, he claims that these uh, uh, plates are forgeries 
so what happens with uh, is that blade so if, suppose you think uh, uh, you, uh, about uh, this history carefully and uh, so now we have got uh, these people the colonial uh, historians uh, who want to seem objective uh, but their aim uh, is to undermine our civilization uh, they want to show that uh, our people uh, have discovered things much later they have been discovered before uh, let's say by europeans so uh, they will try to push the history forward and uh, if it has been uh, pushed forward uh, and there is some evidence that comes and uh, that does not fit uh, then they are just going to destroy it so basically whatever you have has already been vetted uh, by these people and whatever you see uh, is available to us only because uh, it was not considered uh, that it goes against uh, the chronology so and uh, you see that uh, here these three plates they were supposed to be uh, in this two parts volume of this corpus inscriptionum indicarum because uh, all the inscriptions are supposed to be there whether they are considered forgeries or whether they are considered genuine i mean you see that in the earlier ones where even the forged uh, one the one they consider forgery they at least uh, they put it there and said that okay this is forgery but these three plates are simply gone uh, from history because they are not there in this uh, corpus inscription indicarum and also we have got another uh, i have got you another quote here from bandarkar who is uh, uh of course the vandarkar oriental research institute is named after him so very famous historian and then he says uh, uh, uh dr bhav daji was uh, another scholar of that time in one place he dates the five copper plate grants of this dynasty while in another he mentions seven dates but he does not say when or by whom so many grants of vallabhi kings were discovered nor who deciphered and translated them or where the plates of their transcriptions translation are to be found so even the person like bhandarkar he is asking where are where have these gone so it stands to reason that all inscriptions were vetted by the british authorities and only those inscriptions have survived which in the eyes of the colonial authorities did not directly contradict the official chronology so basically what uh, i have done today is uh, that i have given a uh, reasonable uh, evidence to show that uh, there are so many pieces of evidence that do not fit Uh, in the currently accepted uh, chronology and that uh, means that uh, it's possible that uh, the currently accepted sheet anchors may not be correct so what i am going to do is examine what is the evidence for these sheet anchors because all of our history depends upon these identifications upon these sheet anchors and there are two of them so the first one uh, is the identification of sandrocotus with chandragupta Morge, and we are going to. Uh, I'm going to discuss in the next talk who was Sandrocotus of the Greek accounts. Was it Chandragupta Morge, or was it Chandragupta One? I would uh, like to thank uh, Adit Satsangi ji and uh, Dr. Mahendra Thakur and the Satology team uh, for giving me uh, this opportunity uh, to come to you and uh, talk uh, about uh, my research on Indian history. If you want to contact me, uh, these are my contacts thank you so much uh, aditji thank you so much and uh, it said so one question comes to the mind that uh, why did british remove so many evidences or or you know alex cunningham is the guy who did that so what was the reason like why why was he trying what was he trying to embe- embellish so basically uh, you see the british uh, if you go to the british history i mean the, the from the time they came to us i mean initially i i, I it's my impression is that the initially uh, people were good i mean they they were uh, they wanted to know and uh, they recorded what uh, uh, they found uh, like the people like uh, the in the first talk we talked about uh, uh, like sir william jones or uh, mr james uh, prince uh, good people uh, who uh, cataloged everything but uh, you know that uh, the later things changed from east india company uh, to the direct uh, rule of the british and uh, then alexander cunningham uh, he was made the director general of archaeological survey and uh, basically the cunningham himself uh, uh, they picked the person uh, who will uh, kind of help in what they were trying to achieve and which was uh, 
they wanted to undermine our civilization. So, I mean, they were here to exploit India, right? Uh, they were not here for any benevolent purpose. So, and uh, so, and uh, they also, you know, that people of that time, they had this uh, white man's burden. So they had uh, this thinking that they were uh, civilizing the world you know, while they were actually exploiting and destroying the world. Yeah, in the name of civilizing the world, you know, the you know the, the rough accounts are just in North America and you are digging the graves nowadays in Canada. Yes, but, very, very sad. Sorry to uh, really even know about that. And and on the East Coast, where, sorry, on the West Coast where I live, Hunipero Serra, in my last book, Gold, Glory and God, I documented all their at- atrocities. Like uh, 16 to 18 million Native Americans used to live in the Northeast part of uh, North American continent, which is Canada and U.S. combined. And they, they vanished by 1908. They were not there. 1908, yes. they were less in number than the, than the European settlers. And, and in, I'm sure the day that day, uh, graves start digging in California, there'll be much more graves, uh, you know, graves ca- will come out of the children. You know, separating the children just because they want to make them Christians, marrying their women. They were not allowed to marry European women. You know, all these things were there. Of I mean, course. You know, if, if you, so uh, now my little bit tricky question is, how can they be called the champions of human rights now? <laughs> it's a, I mean, you see, the, there are a lot of things happening uh, in the world, right? And uh, People are discovering uh, what has uh, happened. And uh, see, there are a lot of people uh, who are really uh, genuinely uh, good people and uh, they are finding out uh, what has happened. And uh, they are as horrified uh, about what has happened uh, as we are. Uh, even the lots of white people, uh, they, they are also horrified of uh, what was done. And uh, they are setting the history right. I mean, they are working it. And uh, unfortunately, uh, our history has still not been fixed. So we are trying to see uh, how uh, we can discover our true history. You live in the Queen's country. And yes. uh, in my book, I called it an occupied land because Canada had a lot of Native American history, a lot of Native American history. Now, the same people were ruling India, same people. And uh, and. And they must be sharing notes also in the British Parliament. I'm sure they must be sharing notes, how much they have conquered and how much is left and what is left. So uh, so when you talk about all the historical references, sheet anchors you gave, there is not a single sheet anchor available for their history, Native American history. Right, right. I mean, the, see, the, the sad, that's the sad part. I mean, that, that has been, just, so much has been destroyed. Uh, so very, very sad. I mean, uh, those uh, people are, kind of uh, living on the reserves so but uh, uh, people are i mean there are things happening people are trying to uh, do justice to what has happened even in the canadian parliament also i think uh, uh, there have been uh, uh, efforts towards uh, reconciling yeah the same people who actually destroyed and who still believe in the western narrative are trying to set the history right you know how is it possible and i think it's the duty of us indians because they are all searching for us to now give, they they bore the brunt because they're looking for India. Now it is for us to document the right history because if they write the history, it is going to again going to camouflage the actual incidents. You know, which has uh, you know, there is a website, beautiful website on Native American history, which people can go and see that they were not they were very wise people, but generally what it is made out to them as barbaric, or they will kill the white man. Yeah. And, but if you look at the actual recounts, it's like they welcomed them. They gave them food. They gave them shelter. A lot of things are there. What yes, you- yes. The history is full of such uh, sad uh, developments. And it is for us to learn from those. And uh, I mean, uh, we uh, as our civilization, we uh, have never uh, thought of harming our others. And that's what uh, I believe in. I mean, our civilizational uh, understanding that we pray for the happiness of everyone. Sarve bhavan tu sukhina, sarve santu niramya. We pray for everyone's well-being, that everyone be happy, everyone be healthy. And uh, that's what uh, I also practice in my life. 
uh, that uh, pray for everyone uh, to be happy you know uh, sometimes sometimes when we say that we have never we have always wished well for others but to the world recognizes military strength period especially the western world you know you can see what is happening in ukraine you can see that america is dead scared of fighting directly with russia and that's why they are if it was any other country they would have gone in so the west recognizes military strength even though you may not want to hurt them but you should be prepared to hurt them otherwise it's not going to happen and that's how that's how you see a lot of atrocities against hindus being committed by all the invaders especially the hindu hindus were the targets uh, of everyone uh, pra- practically for the religion so what how does this history the discussion that we are having the second series now the third will third will be very very interesting also now because we are coming to that point of establishing that the greek mythology first of all with the greeks really exaggerated everything as per oxford university report not even my report oxford university report so what do you have to say on that that when we set up the indian sheet anchor and the indian historians start challenging the western narratives then it's going to set it up what is your view on that so uh, i mean just uh, talking about your earlier point uh, about this military strength uh, uh, is that our in our civilization right from the beginning uh, we focused on uh, protecting ourselves so the military uh, strength was one of the focus so we uh, never lacked that like we had uh, devoted let's say one quarter of our population uh, towards protecting us right and they were called chatriya and uh, they were not afraid of death i mean uh, they uh, followed uh, their duty and uh, they did it uh, marvelously all through the history i mean it, it it is because of them and of course uh, uh, they were guided uh, by the brahmans uh, it because of uh, uh, this uh, uh, brahmans and the chatriyas uh, that uh, saved our civilization because uh, you can see that look at the history of the rest of the world and you see that uh, they just uh, capitulated uh, they just uh, the whole civilizations were wiped out so i i mean we had the mighty emperors like you can see the uh, the samudgupta pillar where he describes uh, all uh, uh, his conquering uh, uh, he conquered most of india uh, and uh, there were so, so many of them so uh, the military strength was there uh, it was only uh, that uh, uh, we kind of became complacent or our uh thinking uh, got corrupted and uh, uh we we didn't uh, we let the invaders uh escape let's say uh, when we won uh, but the invaders uh, did not uh, reciprocate so that that's what has happened but uh, we have to uh, accept that history and uh, we have to uh, learn from history and uh, as far as uh, the history is concerned uh, i think uh, the current uh, time the historians are open uh, to examining the evidence and uh, uh, if the evidence is there uh, then uh, hopefully they will accept it uh, it will go through uh, the review process and uh, it will be cited it will be discussed and uh, we'll see uh, what happens the important point uh, is uh, for me uh, to uh, put here uh, to the people uh, what i have discovered what is the evidence and uh, what is my interpretation and ultimately it will be for the people uh, to see uh, for themselves to think for themselves uh, what the evidence says you no know, when you talk about scholarly consensus scholarly consensus is something which also means that keeping out certain people certain views and then you don't get all the views together you know so so there is currently the western scholarly consensus we need to have the indian scholarly consensus because the indian population is bigger than the western population so so that we have not seen so so there has to be a western scholarly consensus versus indian scholarly consensus so where do you see that emerging so uh, that's a uh, interest an interesting question because uh, I, you know that i am from science and engineering so we don't really go by consensus i mean in our case we do experiments right we get uh, data and we just go by the data right <laughs> so whatever the data says and uh, so 
it, it should be the same uh, for the history also. I mean, in the, what is the data there? I mean, in science, you do the experiments, so you, you are generating the data. Of course, for the history, you cannot be generating data. So for the historical purpose, the data is uh, what is there in the, let's say, inscriptions, uh, in, uh, in the other records, to, uh, what has come to us. And those uh, have to be analyzed. And uh, what I am trying to say here that we have got evidence and historians have come up with a certain chronology based upon that evidence. And uh, it, it is possible that the same evidence uh, also can be interpreted to support, support another chronology. Yeah, no, I mean, most of the engineers and scientists are doing the research nowadays. Humanities have gone south because humanities are just following the Western consensus model. So the most of the I, most of the researchers are science backgrounds. Most of them, including yourself, you are a scientist. So most of the researchers are from the science background. So so the the point is where has the humanities failed now? <laughs> humanities and history departments. I'm pretty sure they are uh, very uh, learned people in the history departments. Uh, sometimes you just get uh, like uh, fixed by. Uh, certain ideas you consider them sacrosanct and uh, uh, if those ideas uh, can be challenged then hopefully they will listen in in my so many years they have not listened so i i you know we have to come up with an alternative model because they're they're not going to listen Although if you if they listen to you and me and all the other researchers who are doing research on mahabharat and studying mahabharat then uh, their entire basis is shaken now so their entire salaries that they have got for so many hundreds of years is all gone in the waste so taxpayers money is wasted now so where are they going to go how how will they change how can they say that i've been taking salary i've taken a million dollars for this research that research everything is a waste i was lying all the all the time how can they say that so, so we have to come and say hey you are lying all the time because that's that's going to challenge them so we need some disruptive in challenging the Western status quo. What do you say? I, I believe that uh, things uh, will happen. Uh, ultimately, I mean, uh, see, ultimately things will be decided uh, by the evidence, right? And uh, whatever uh, evidence dictates, uh, uh, that's where uh, we need to go or the historians uh, uh, will take notice. I mean, we have to uh, keep trying. I mean, uh, uh, nothing happens overnight. Uh, it, it will take time, but uh, and uh, it's uh, uh, our uh, duty to try to understand. Uh, we are part of a great civilization. Uh, unfortunate uh, things have happened, but uh, we need to uh, set uh, things right, and uh, we need to learn from them, and uh, we will be great again. You know, we are all be great. Uh, we are all be great uh, even today. But thank yes. you so much, Dr. Raja Ramon Roy, and for coming on the show and, and establishing gradually. I think I think the viewers wait for watch this till the end, comment on it, and watch the next one also, because that's where we're going to talk about Sandra Cotus mythology. <laughs> I call it mythology because I th I'm sure we're going to with all these uh, evidences that you're putting out together. Thank you so much, Raja, Dr. Raja Ramon Roy. Pleasure to talk to you always. And for all the viewers who are watching, do comment on the video. Let us know your feedback. Thank you so much, Aditi. Thank you. Namaskar. Namaskar.